Hi everyone, it's me. And if you like my channel, please like and subscribe. There's a notifications bell over there and you can get notified as when I'm going live. Um, sometimes I just go live, sometimes I schedule it for later. Um, just got back from the gym a little bit ago, so I've got little, little flippies, <laughs> little flyaways. So I've been asked a lot about my time being displaced and the differences and really how I manage my life afterwards. So to get into really how displacement affected me and what the differences are, I really have to go on into each time I was displaced. And I would say the first time I remember being homeless or displaced, I was eight years old, eight or nine. I'm really unsure of when I turned nine. <laughs> so I was a little kid. And I remember being in this hotel and being really hungry. And I had a bike and I just ride it in the parking lot. And the manager of the hotel, he, um, his kid, he had a kid my age. And so we'd talk and stuff. It's the first time I ever had a cassette tape given to me. And the church had donated a huge box of cherry pop tarts. And that was wonderful. And they got enough to get us an apartment. The problem being was that the issues that were never, that weren't addressed at that time during displacement was the health care of us children. It wasn't looked into. It wasn't looked into to see, you know, why when we were in the apartment, he'd disappear for a couple days. You know, we weren't followed up on. There was no healthcare worker to make sure we were okay. And so that was the first time, um, other than just moving as a child, that I first remember being displaced um, and really wishing that now as an adult that other adults, healthcare providers would have been involved because they would have, you know, it would have um, definitely lowered my ACEs score. So there's that. Um, good evening, Glenn. Nice to see you. Um, so that was the first time. So we're going to go into the second time um, that, but here's, okay, a little caveat. Um, when you go into foster care, I know for myself, it was feeling homeless a lot. Um, and what I mean by that is even though that was your home, you always knew that it could very well not be permanent. That your even if it wasn't your action, something happened in their lives. You know, this is not permanent. You are not adopted. And so there was always this sense of not being home. Um, even if I called it home, it wasn't the sense of that was my home. It was a place to stay and people that decided they wanted to take care of people. And of course, there was love there. And I called them mom and dad things like that, but there was an internal sense of displacement. Um, Roberto, hello from very cold Canada and it's snowing here right now. Oh, not fun. <laughs> I do not enjoy cold. Oh, hate the cold. <laughs> so um, now we're going to go into uh, the second time I was displaced and I was a runaway. I had been through over five homes and was in a group home on the living side. Um, I was 15 years old. First time I ran away, it was to a friend's house. And my, and the reason that I left was, um, I had a heroin addict for mother and because she had never been around and I'd only been told things from the foster care system about her. Um, I had weaved a tale in my head of this amazing woman that no one understood. And all she needed was for her daughter to come and help her and help watch the kids and be there. And so I convinced myself, you know, just built up this image of my head 
the one person that hadn't been there that I could weave this tale about that there was no reality for me as to who this person was. And so my idea after my social worker said I'd be living in a group home till I was 18, which was three years, um, I decided to leave because in my head at 15, I could take care of myself better than any of these foster you know, <laughs> adults. Um, and so I left. Uh, the first time I went to a friend's house and I ran with another girl and um, he was threatened with a sheltering a runaway and I was turned in. And the second time I hit the interstate. And I won't go into all the things that happened but I did hitchhike from Montana to California to try to find my mother. And then I hitchhiked across the country. Once I realized that I had to get my high school diploma, that I was going to be lying about my name and my age and where I was from if I didn't stop for the rest of my life. And that's just not, I couldn't do it. I wanted, if I couldn't save her, I wanted to save me. You know, I, I felt like I had some worth. And so I hitchhiked back to Montana and I had a teacher that was really amazing. And she was my middle school teacher and she had taken me horseback riding and really kind of took me into her family. And she was like an aunt to me. And I was on a missing persons, you know, like a runaway alert through Montana. So I couldn't go back into the state. They, they would have put me in a group home. I wouldn't have got my education. It would have been more trauma. So we got me into a program called Job Corps. And I was able there to, at 16, I went in and I was able to complete my high school diploma in a trade by the time I was 17. Um, and then I want to talk about, so that was, that was the end of my second time homeless. And this is you know, 17 years old. So this has been a lifetime of trauma and trying to understand a healthy way of life or a non-dysfunction or try to figure out from a grasping from all these people around me, you know, try to figure out what the best qualities are and, and take them into myself. And that was very difficult to do because I was also dealing with complex PTSD, bipolar Fibromyalgia, a lot of physical illnesses as well. And then I got into a domestic, at 17, I moved to Wyoming and was in a domestic, um, domestically violent marriage. Um, I had my first child at 17. And after that, um, with endometriosis, I had um, a portion of my uterus removed and uh, tubal. I had a lot of surgeries and I did that really my ex-husband was in basic. So I was doing that on my own. Um, it was a very, another trauma. Um, so the next time I was homeless would have been, and I, here's the thing. I didn't even understand that I was homeless at this time. Um, when I got back from Germany, I had to live with, um, me and the children had to live with some friends and try to get a place. And then we moved to Wisconsin. Um, and that whole time I was, it was in between homes and, you know, and, and that I didn't understand what that was doing to me and my attachment. And, you know, I wasn't concerned about myself. I was concerned about my children, but it did have an impact on me. Now, the next time I was homeless, um, was when I was, I'm trying to think of what it was, 37 or 38. <laughs> um, I left Louisiana. I left my marriage. I left my home <laughs> and decided to save my life and get brain injury treatment. And I left and I went to Montana where I stayed with my half brother and he helped me get into a neurologist and get uh, back all my seizure meds, get what I needed as far as medication and then I stayed with my uh, half sister for a little while and that didn't work out. And I left because I had in my whole mind, I had to get to Seattle. I had to get to Harborview. I had to get brain injury treatment. And no matter what, I had to save my life, period. This was, I knew this. So what that meant was because I had no support or system, I was, you know, I was, I'm brain injured. I am brain injured. I am a TBI survivor. I'm five time 
traumatic brain injury survivor as an adult. That's not counting what happened as a child. So I was going to save my life, which meant cognitive therapy, behavioral therapy, whatever. So when I got to Seattle, um, I hitchhiked from Kalispell, Montana. And I hitchhiked into Seattle, um, which risky behavior is also a thing with traumatic brain injury. We got to be real careful about that. Um, but I hitchhiked in and I knew I needed to find my son. My son had left Louisiana at the same time. He was also uh, homeless at the time. And I didn't have a phone. So I just like... And if you've looked through uh, my community feed, you'll see my Ignite uh, talk where I talked about my first night homeless. Um, and I lived under a bridge and I went and got medical care. And I told people, hey, for a woman who is brain injured and has numerous physical disabilities, um, this is affordable housing until I get help. I mean, that didn't mean that I didn't go to my medical appointment, you know, try as hard as I could to get to my medical appointments, try to help other people, try to get the things done that I needed to survive as well and keep myself alive until help arrived really, or that I could figure out a way to do it on my own. And through that, I'm going to talk about now some of the differences between that life and the trauma that occurred there and healing from that and being homed now. So one of the first things I wanna talk about is financial. I'm gonna I'm start with financial. I get a lot of questions about how I do it after homelessness, financial things while I was homeless. And financially, while I was homeless, I would, I'm on food stamps, I, would, I had my medical, um, they did not approve me for disability until after I was housed, which was a little, honestly, ridiculous. Hold on, I'm grabbing my coffee. I need it. So I did what I needed to do, and that meant going to the food banks, and that also meant spanging. And spanging is bear changing. It's panhandling. And I want to say something to people right now. Panhandling is sitting with a sign either interactive or whatever, it is not harassing people. If someone is harassing you, that is not panhandling. That's against the law. If someone is in your space and they are yelling at you or they are trying to assault you, that is not pan. Please, please quit equating harassment with panhandling. It is not the same thing. So now that I'm off of that tirade, <laughs> Um, I spanged. And one of the things that was really different for me to feel was the sense of autonomy. I was able to have money. It wasn't much. I mean, $10 or whatever. But I was allowed to figure out what I needed or wanted and have the ability to do that without anyone behind me or yelling at me or screaming at me or or the guilt or the shame. Well, I still had to deal with guilt and shame. I, I, I had a pretty overdeveloped sense of um, shame and guilt. And that's actually one of the reasons that I really started the vlog as well is I refuse to feel shamed anymore. I will not feel shame. It, I mean, I will, but I'm going to combat it. It, it shouldn't be there. I should be able to talk about the things that happen in my life and, and talk about what's going on now without feeling a sense of guilt or a sense of shame. And that was one thing that was actually really wonderful about panhandling was learning that I could trust myself, learning that I had the ability to choose what I needed to do to survive and actually do that in the best way I knew how with the best quality of life I could. Um, so I'm actually going to put panhandling as a very wholly positive experience, actually. Um, it provided a way for me to get the things I needed to survive, to get to the food bank, get clean water, um, get my device discharged, get all the things I needed to do for basic survival and still have something 
to be able to provide for some needs, um, whether that be batteries, whether that be propane, no matter what it was, something I wanted. Maybe it was a candy bar. Maybe it was a cup of coffee. But it allowed me to have a sense of self and a sense of autonomy, whereas I didn't have that in my previous life. Um, and that was as much as it hurt my body and hurt my soul. I think the most hard thing about it was that it was really soul crushing. Um, people don't didn't see me. They saw what they wanted to see. They saw someone who looked okay. They saw someone who they didn't know, you know, wasn't on drugs. They didn't know wasn't on alcohol. They saw someone who was dirty. They equated my situation as a lack of morality. Like I was a bad person. Remember the first time I really bawled was when I was out and I think I was out with Austin. Uh, we just gotten on spanging and I have a real hard time with cold. So I was layered up. I looked like a snowman with dirty hair. It was horrible. <laughs> I, like I was all puffed out. <laughs> I had my lard tucked in there. I had like fishing pants on that were real. It was crazy. I did. I probably looked a little crazy. I'm not going to lie. Like when it's really cold, sense of style, don't care don't care. I will, I will layer ridiculous things to stay warm. And so I, did, I wasn't even thinking about it. It was just cold. It was snowy. I was tired. My feet hurt. We needed to make it back to camp. And there was a couple walking down the sidewalk and I didn't think anything of it until the man grabbed his partner, his wife, I don't know, and uh, moved her out of the way. Like she was in danger. And just gave us the most nasty look. And I'd never really been treated that way in my life. And that was really difficult. And it hurt so bad. And I learned how to deal with it. And I learned that when people pulled their children away, I was just sitting there with a sign. Like there was something wrong with me. And I wanted to yell out, hey, I'm a mother. I have children. And I'm proud of them. You know, this situation is not who I am. It's just something that happened to me right now. But you can't explain that when people are just walking by. Um, so that was kind of difficult. Um, but that's the financial part of it. Now, I will say being homed, I have way more questions about my financial solvency. And I think, honestly, as I've talked to other people and talked to friends, um, I think it's because they're wondering how to get out of a situation or whatever that may be. So here's the thing. Even if you are disabled, do what you can. I am no longer going to say that I don't work. I work hard. I have a business. I collaborate with other people. The thing is, there's really no money right now. And that's okay. That's okay because I'm doing something that fulfills me. I'm doing something that is going to change the world. I'm doing things that is life-saving and changes lives. And so for me, that's okay. Now, financially, yes, I am in shelter plus care. I'm disabled. No matter how much I try, I'm still struggling. Doesn't make me a bad person. Doesn't make me lazy. Doesn't make me anything but someone who is trying their best. I also get food stamps. How I supplement that is by going to the food bank. And I have amazing, amazing people that send donations, that check up and see if there's anything that I need. Keeping me in coffee, Kat um, G just sent a bunch of home supplies like peanut butter and rice and macaroni. And 
I am shown kindness. I am blessed. Now, I also get, um, until my social security comes in, a little over $100 to be able to pay bills with. As anyone can see, that doesn't always pan. No, you can't. It's ridiculous. There is no way to provide because food stamps doesn't provide for cleaning supplies, any of that. So I'm very lucky that people have donated those things to me to make, to make my life easier, to make my life blessed, to make me feel like I'm worth it. And to have that finally, after feeling alone for a lifetime, really. Yes, there were people there and people gave and whatever, but there was always a sense that I was a step away from disaster. Um, so that was, so being in a home and having basic needs met, I can cook for my family. I can stay warm. I can go to bed and I bed and know that I can lock my door and it's going to be okay. I can take my sleeping meds and know that I'm going to be okay. And that I can sleep and wake refreshed. It's a huge deal. But it also took me like a year to really feel some sort of security. To feel like at any moment it wasn't going to end and I wasn't going to be out there. I still have a packed a pack with a tent, life straw, um, all necessities, some dried food, everything, a mag light, <laughs> everything I could possibly need in case it happens again. That's still a sense of security for me. Now, how did I get? from being displaced to in an apartment. Universe provided, that's all I can say. I tried as hard as I could until there was an opening in uh, the shelter plus care. Um, and that's what got me housed. My social worker got me housed. What got me exposure, of course, was the invisible people. And that's where people really learn about the situation. I'm so thankful for it that they learned about my blog and, and really are, are learning about uh, the issues facing us. But the best thing about my life right now is that I'm getting health care, good health care. Um, I refuse to feel guilt for needing a hand up because by getting a hand up, I can provide others with also a hand up. Um, I feel so blessed to have loved ones all over the world now and people that care and people that really, truly want me to be okay and want my family to be okay and are changing the world themselves to be able to know these people and to be able to watch them and, and say, that is so inspiring. That is so beautiful. That is so kind. And to continue working for that in my community is a blessing. To be in a building, an apartment building where I have a fitness center right next door, like literally, the fitness room is next door to my apartment so I can get safe exercise when my head won't let me leave and I can still be safe in my environment and take care of myself and practice self-care. It's a beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing to be cared for and have human rights and have people around you that believe that you are worth enough for that. So that's my differences. If you have any other, and also, you know, ask questions. I'm going to start addressing comments right now. Um, but also one thing I learned while displaced is there is a huge community of really impoverished 
destitute, vulnerable people with the most compassionate, beautiful souls. And I'm lucky to have spent time with them. And sometimes I miss it. But I also am very blessed because most of those people are still in my life. And that makes me feel so happy. So I'm going to address comments right now. Okay. Um, then good evening from the UK. Hi, from Seattle. Hello from very cold Canada. How's life treating you? Actually, it's it's going okay. I've been struggling a little bit, but um, going to the gym a little bit to try to overcome that. Just work my body harder than my mind is screaming. Um, and like I said, I've been very blessed. I've been very blessed with people that love me and care about me and check up on me and, and make sure that I'm doing okay. And um, just a, a message uh, to build to. That is one thing in talking about the shame and embarrassment. Um, you know, I've been asked a few times and I was just asked recently by Bill to um, make an Amazon list of personal things um, that I, I needed or wanted. And I have to say, it's really difficult still. It is still really difficult to put together something for self rather than for community. And I'm going to get it up in the next day or two, or maybe even today. But I just want to let everybody know that that is something I still struggle with. And, um, but I'm going to do it because I think actually that's kind of healthy. And I appreciate, I appreciate that thought. I appreciate that thought from people. I think it's beautiful. Um, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. Um, hi, David. Be kind. You don't need to feel shame. Nobody should be. I think you're really amazing. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Oh, hi. Your name is Sally. Hi. <laughs> um, hugs from Lebanon. Lebanon is interesting. I don't know much about Lebanon. I should learn more about it. Um, I think you should be on the Ellen show. Ellen is so kind. I would be happy to hear your story. I thought she, re I thought, honestly, didn't Ellen retire? I believe she retired. And yes, she really is an amazing person and um, has changed a lot of lives. And I think that's beautiful and wonderful. Mike Maloney, how can I help? Um, you are by being a positive force in this world and um, by spreading that love and joy. I, I think that is helping. I think that that's what we all need is to really educate ourselves and get out there and meet people and, and understand what's going on in um, this world. And so I want also people to know as well that displacement a lot of times ends, especially when you're young, ends in chronic displacement. And I never really thought about that till this last time. And being in your late 30s and disabled, you start to understand that your lifespan is being shortened every day you're out there, that this will kill you early. Just like heart disease or any other, um, I could name a million diseases that lower lifespan, but displacement lowers it by about 15 years. And that's hard to deal with. That's hard to deal with knowing that your conditions also do that, limit your ability. Um, Glenn, your situation improved so much based on your homeless people from the face and voice for this issue. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I really do. And um, something interesting that happened to me. Um, I really get along with the new manager and my building. And she actually has some very different viewpoints on um, the displacement crisis. And it's very, it's very educational for me to listen to those viewpoints. We don't agree on some stuff, but um, it's definitely educating me as to different viewpoints and how we can really educate people, you know, if we listen to them and we listen to maybe some of the misunderstandings or stereotypes or any number of things out there. I think it's really important to listen and hear what people are saying, even if it sounds like, hey, well, okay, caveat on that as well. <laughs> when it comes to this issue, I believe in listening to people as long as it doesn't get extremist and they are just not willing, it, you know, when you have, 
what's called willful ignorance. In other words, you've been educated and you continue to be ignorant. That's on you. I, I, that's, that's, that's when you leave people like, I'll, I'll leave people alone. I have, I have a message and I want to reach the right people. And if they're continuing to be willfully ignorant, that's on them. And that's something that I keep out of my life because it's a negative influence on me. Um, but she's not, she's, she's amazing really. Um, so I do want to be a voice. I want to be a force for good. I want to be the best person that I can be and live the best life that I can live. Um, and what I was going to say also about the caveat to that is not on this channel. Um, on my YouTube blog and my Being Camp Mom blog, I'm very big on keeping it a positive space for myself. I need this to be a positive experience. To be able to continue, there has to be that positivity. And there are people that do troll. There are people that write. And I do have a moderation on YouTube where it um, moderates comments and things. But there are some people that get really just insanely crazy even even so far as to watching things that they add like watching me when they don't like me just to make negative comments and um they're banned i will block somebody in a heart my block game is strong come at me with negative stuff or something that i don't want to deal with and my youtube or my facebook you blocked you done this is my positive space if you have something to say get a channel they're free. You can do it from the library. You can do it from wherever you want. You want your voice heard? Speak and find your tribe. But this is not your place. So that is the caveat to listening, <laughs> to hearing people. I want to hear people and I want it done in a um, in an educational manner and I want to do it in a way that's positive for everybody. And so I do keep my space positive. That's, that's a big deal to me. Um, is there, oh, she didn't retire yet. She still has her shirt. I did not know that. I, I really thought she'd retire. Cool. Lebanon is a country that's going through social and economic. It's a beautiful country though. I'm going to look it up. I want to, I want to check it out. That's, I, that's the thing is I love it when, uh, when there's viewers from all different places, because it also gives me a chance to really, um, reach out and learn about where everybody's from. Like I, this is a, it's a big world and it, in a small world in a sense as well, but we're all, we are all on this together. We are all on this rock and we're here together. And, um, it's a beautiful world. And, um, as a global community, I believe that we can really reach out, change things. And, Collaborating, whether that be community, um, city, national, wherever, global, it, you know, it reaches globally and um, it's a huge impact. And I appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to end the vlog. Um, and I, I just, if anybody has any questions or comments for me, I'm going to give it a few seconds. And um, if not, I am going to say bye. And um, actually, later today, I will be back on. Um, I want to talk about uh, Seattle uh, Homeless Outreach Program and what they do um, as far as getting supplies to people. Because I'd mentioned before, um, I'll carry little things now, but the big stuff I just can't. I can't do anymore. Um, I got some nerve damage, and with the arthritis and things, it's it's really tearing my body up. And without a vehicle, it just makes it extremely, extremely difficult. Um, so at this time I'm going to support other agencies that are doing amazing work and, um, and really educate people about those. So that's what I'm going to do later. <laughs> what I'm going to do now is I'm going to enjoy my coffee, um, clean house and made it to the gym today. I'm feeling, I am feeling really productive. <laughs> so I just want to tell all of you, um, sending so much love. And if you'd like to support me in my mission, um, in the description, there are numerous ways you can do so. And another way to support me is just send me positive messages too. Like that's, that's amazing. And it makes me feel so good. So either way, 
doesn't matter. I appreciate you so very much and have a beautiful, wonderful day. Bye everyone.